beautiful churches, and all these things are part of my sermon today. But I want to talk about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist actually gets two Sundays in the lectionary of Advent. We don't usually do it because one of them is Christmas Pageant Sunday, and that beats John the Baptist. <laughs> but he's described in all four Gospels in great detail, announcing Jesus, baptizing people, and baptizing Jesus himself. The Spirit of God comes down like a dove and announces Jesus as, as the child of God because of John the Baptist's presence. And he's the one who calls Jesus the Lamb of God. That's why there's always a lamb in pictures of John the Baptist. So why is John the Baptist's word so important? Why is he lifted up so much as the messenger? Why is he given so much importance? And the answer is very interesting. It's very possible that he was a much bigger celebrity than Jesus, that he was well known. The Roman Jewish historian Josephus, who is often cited as the historical reference for the things that were happening around the time of Jesus, he goes into great detail about John the Baptist and says very little about Jesus. And so it makes you wonder, maybe they were doing what we all do, right? Trying to lift up something's importance by taking somebody else everybody's heard of and having them lift it up, right? That's why John the Baptist matters. Now, there is a chance that even in Josephus, it's all sort of a mythology. And it's hard to know because they were so separated by history, but it doesn't matter because either way, it serves the same purpose. Somebody that people have heard of is telling them about the importance of somebody they're learning about, right? But John isn't traditionally important, right? He wears camel hair, which if you've never been on a camel, it's not comfortable. <laughs> he eats locusts and honey and he lives in the wilderness and he shouts at the religious establishment and calls them a brood of vipers. He's not traditionally important. And what Jesus asks in the scripture today is an important question. Why did you go see him? He says that to the crowd, this guy, this crazy man in the wilderness shouting at authority. Why did you go see him? Why did you go out there? Why did you bother? It wasn't easy to travel out to the wilderness. So what took you there? Was it his nice clothes? No. Was it just to see an oddity? No, it's more than that. He's not a king or a ruler. So what took you? What grabbed you to go see this prophet in the wilderness. And I want to share with you an image. I'm, I'm hoping they can put that up there. Uh, it's on the cover of your order of service, an image from El Greco, uh, the wonderful uh, Greek artist who lived in Spain uh, and uh, lived in Toledo. And I had the opportunity to visit his, uh, his work in Toledo where he lived. But he's the perfect person to capture John the Baptist, right? He's got the lamb, the traditional imagery. The lamb is there because he called Jesus the lamb of God. He's got the staff. He's got his weird clothes. And the way El Greco paints, what's so beautiful about El Greco's paintings is he captures that sense of both body and spirit, that it's a spiritual image, a divine image, and also a human image, that somehow John the Baptist is straddling this line between the worldly and the sacred. There's something ethereal about the image. And when I went to Toledo, I'll show you the next, if you put on the next image, the burial of the Count of Orgaz. This is one of El Greco's most famous paintings, and it's in a church in Toledo, and I went to see it. And I've seen pictures of it a thousand times, but when you stand there, it's something different, because not only are you seeing it right where he painted it to be, you're seeing it where the actual event took place that he was depicting, this burial of Count Orgaz. So at the base of this painting, is the burial site of this count. And what this painting depicts is saints appeared and helped to bury him, that he was such a holy and sacred person that saints appeared, it's Saint Stephen and Saint Augustine appeared at the site and helped lay him to rest. And what this painting is about is exactly what I'm talking about. It's about breaking that veil. Whatever it is that separates this world that we see from the divine world, this is a painting, it's an image about crossing that boundary about somehow God breaks through that boundary and is visible in our midst. The holy and the sacred are right here, right now. I think the answer to Jesus' question, why did you go out into the wilderness? It's the same answer as why I go see art or why we want to listen to live music or why it matters to be here in the sanctuary. We love Zoom, but it's not the same. 
We want to be here and hear this amazing choir and the way that it resonates and we feel it inside us. Being there is different. I want to use the example of the Sistine Chapel. I, I, I think they have an image of this that will be completely unintelligible because it's so tiny. But it's the entire Sistine Chapel ceiling. Now, I know probably many of you have been there to see it in person, and it's an incredible experience, right? Yeah, to be there and say, this is where he painted it. This is where Michelangelo painted this, right in this room, and it was designed to fit these exact corners and to be seen from exactly where I'm standing. And it's about that sense of trying to just break that veil a little bit. And I don't know if you've had this experience, but when I have those experiences where something spiritual is there, I just get goosebumps and I feel it in the pit of my stomach. And I know that there's more than what I can see. And I know we're connected in ways I can only imagine. That's what we go out to see. That's why we go out to the wilderness, to get a glimpse of the divine. We go to see God and to experience the presence of God. And we have to go and be there and be here and be in connection with each other to experience it and to know it fully. And once we know it, we seek it again and again, right? We keep going back to new places to try to just get a little glimpse of that sense that God is present right here, right now. Now, I've said seeing God in the world is a choice, and I believe that. Right? Being a person of faith doesn't mean we see a different world than everybody else sees. It means we look at this world that we all see differently. Right? We look at it and we say there is more here than can be seen. There's greater connection, there's greater love, there's greater hope, there's greater possibility. There is more to this than what we see. We see God in the world, we experience God in the world because we believe God to be present. And so we go and we seek it. I've told this story before and I'm gonna keep telling it because it's, it was a powerful moment for me. It was a sacred moment for me. And it starts, uh, well, it sort of starts in 312 AD when the Roman Emperor Constantine became a Christian, right? And there's a lot of questions about why he became a Christian. Did he become a Christian for political reasons? Was it just sort of convenience? I think, was he sincere in his faith? Or I think the most likely answer, he became a Christian because his mother was a Christian, right? A very devout Christian, Helena. And when, once he became Christian, she had the might of the Roman Empire behind her. And she went to the Holy Land and she found holy sites and said, this is where Jesus was buried. And they built the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. And she went to Bethlehem and she talked to shepherds and other people in the town and said, this is the spot where Jesus is born and we're gonna build a church right here. Now, is that the spot? Probably not. Who knows? There's some question if Jesus was even born in Bethlehem. But here's the thing, so I went because I was on a tour and we went to Bethlehem and I thought this probably isn't even the spot, but it's kind of amazing because there's the church, that, there's the Justinian church that was built after the first one was destroyed and then there was another church built on top of that, and another church built on top of that, and they're all there. And they're all mashed up together. There's a whole bunch of churches sort of smashed together over this spot that Jesus was born. And you wait in this giant crowd, there's no line, it's just a mob and everybody's pushing and it's really unpleasant. You get down to the basement and there's a hole in the floor where you reach through and touch the rock where Jesus was born. And I thought, this is dumb. <laughs> Why am I doing this? And I reached through that hole and I'm getting it right now. I got goosebumps and I could feel it. And something changed and it wasn't because Jesus was born right there. It was because every Christian that had ever come there had brought their faith with them. And they left a little part of it there. There were centuries of faith by countless Christians right there poured into that spot. And now I was a part of it. 
And I could feel that connection. And if you know me, you know that's God in the world, the way that we are connected to one another, the way that we feel one another, the way that we lift each other up. That's God in the world. That's what I'm talking about. That's where we see it. That's why we go. That's why we come here. That's why we come back to Christmas every year. Why do we do it? Why do we do all the nonsense and we complain about it and the lights and the mess and the money and ugh. But the reason we do it is the same reason as the answer to all these other questions. To get a glimpse of God. To get a little glimpse of the light that breaks through the darkness and cannot be overcome. And then that light becomes a part of us. And then we get to share that light with the world. That's why we bother. Thanks be to God. Amen.